My name is Aaron Vance, and I'm a senior McConnell Scholar. It's also been my honor to have served as the student body president of this university this past year. That in mind, I have about 33 days left, but who's counting? You all read the news. You know what's been going on. As well, it has been such a joy to have been a McConnell Scholar this past year and these past four years. And it's a privilege tonight to host what will be my last public event as a scholar with the McConnell Center. Tonight, we will conclude our series on the challenges and opportunities facing the American presidency by turning our attention to the world. Our speaker tonight is Peter Zion. Geopolitical strategist Peter Zion is a global energy, demographic, and security expert. Zion's worldview marries the realities of geography and populations to a deep understanding of how global politics impact markets and economic trends, helping industry leaders to navigate today's complex mix of geopolitical risks and opportunities. With a keen eye for what will drive tomorrow's headlines, his irreverent approach transforms topics that are normally dense and heavy into accessible, relevant takeaways for audiences of all types. In his career, Zion has ranged from working for the U.S. State Department in Australia to the D.C. think tank community to helping develop the analytical models for Stratfor, one of the world's premier private intelligence companies. Mr. Zion founded his own firm, Zion on Geopolitics, in 2012 in order to provide a select group of clients with a direct, custom, analytical product. Today, those clients represent a vast array of sectors, including energy majors, financial institutions, business associations, agricultural interests, universities, and the U.S. military. His freshman book, The Accidental Superpower, forecasts the coming collapse of the global order, and it de debuted in 2014. And as you all may remember, he came and spoke on that book here, right when that came out. And his newest project, the Absent Superpower, published in December 2016, highlights what might be coming next. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Peter Zion. Need the magic clicker. So let's just take a poll real quick so we all know where we stand. How many people in this room voted for either Trump or Clinton? Okay, how many people in this room were excited about voting for either Trump or Clinton? <laughs> Higher percentage than I get in most audiences, so that's good that some of you actually wanted to vote for someone. Most of us voted against someone. <laughs> what we're going to do today is do a quick uh, refresher on how we got to where we are, and then talk about where we're going. Uh, this is obviously an atypical administration, but we're in an atypical time, and you know, from my point of view, the two kind of go together very well. So. Without further ado, let's see if I can actually turn this on. There we go. Okay, first things first. Tan area of this map. This is why the United States is the global superpower and will remain so long after your great-grandchildren are gone. The greater Midwest outproduces the next two food-producing regions together. That is important, but it's the blue lines that make all the difference. Moving things from A to B is a bit of a bitch, but if you can float them, it's one-twelfth the cost. The greater Mississippi by itself, that's 13,000 miles of interconnected, naturally occurring waterway. That is more internal transport capacity, naturally occurring, than the combined rivers of the rest of the world put together. And we have 5,000 miles additional, just in case. In addition, ocean moats on either side, mountains and deserts to the south, forests and lakes to the north. In addition to the United States being the richest chunk of territory on the planet, we are the most securable. We are condemned to being an economic, financial, agricultural, industrial, cultural, military superpower. We cannot possibly mess this up. <laughs> and we have tried so very hard. <laughs> this is what trade used to look like. You didn't trade with your neighbors, much less people on the other side of the planet because you never knew who, when some moron whose language you didn't understand was going to throw a war, and you would lose access to whatever the resource or the trade route or the market was that you thought was important. So if you saw something that you thought you needed, 
you went out and took it. You confiscated it. You colonized it. You expanded into empire. These empires clashed over resources, markets, access. Those conflicts escalated into wars. Those wars culminated into World War II, which brought the whole system crashing down, leaving it to the last country standing, the United States, to figure out what's next. So what did we Americans do? We granted all of our allies a seat at a table in a place called Bretton Woods. We held a conference. And what do you do at a conference? You bait people in with a beautiful location and the promise of golf, and then you lock them into a room with no windows until they agree with you. <laughs> We've all been there. Now at Bretton Woods, the United States explained that the global system was going to work differently from now on. Instead of everybody having their own militarized, sequestered imperial network, everything would be pooled. All resources, all markets, the global ocean, the US would patrol them all. All resources would be available if you could pay for them. All finished goods could be exported to the wider world, even if it didn't touch American shores. There were a couple sweeteners in there. One of them, the United States, would open its market first so everybody could export their way back to affluence after World War II. Second, the United States would grant military protection to everyone represented at the table, allowing them physical security. There was just one catch. You had to pick sides. You heard that right. We bribed up an alliance to fight and win the Cold War, to contain and defeat the Soviets. And it worked really well. Over the next 70 years, global GDP has expanded by a factor of 10. The global population has tripled. We expanded the network first to the defeated Axis, then to most of the developed world, up to and including China itself. This was the plan all along. Bribe everybody into the same group. There's just one flaw in the plan. We won. Oops. 1989, the wall fell. Four years later, the Soviet Union was gone. Then President Bush, senior, put together a team to figure out what's next. Some names you're probably going to recognize. Dick Cheney, Brent Scowcroft, Colin Powell. He sent them off to dream up what's Bretton Woods II. How do we take this alliance, the greatest alliance in human history, and play it forward for another half century of American preeminence? And we Americans were so impressed, we voted him out of office. And in the next seven consecutive electoral contests, we chose the domestic candidate. The economic aspects of Bretton Woods, the idea that global markets are open, that the US market is open, that the US would do all the heavy lifting internationally, that was allowed to continue. But the security quid pro quo that had made it worth America's while in the first place, that fell by the wayside. And 30 years later, that's taken, to us, a pla taken us to a place that we're not very comfortable with. China's overtaken us as the number one manufacturing power. Brazil is giving our farmers a run for their money. The Russians are indicating that throwing your weight around on the international stage is no longer a purely American prerogative. But you've got to remember a few things. What enables these countries that we're not sure about to do the things that allows them to be the countries that we're not sure about is Bretton Woods. What's Russia without global energy markets? or Brazil without access to international credit, or China without global market access. These countries can't function in their current form, if they can function at all, without America's implicit security guarantees and without American guaranteed open markets. Remove that, you remove them. Second, never forget that for the Americans, trade isn't about trade, trade's about security. Bretton Woods was ultimately a security plot. And so we never bet our economy on it. As a percentage of GDP, we're the least involved economy in the world. Last year, only 8.2% of our economic strength came from merchandise exports. A third of that was within NAFTA. A third of that was within NAFTA. The Americans can have their regional trade without having global trade. There's no local security challenge. Third, when we do back away, we'll still have these suckers. 
One American aircraft carrier battle group has more long-range projection-based firepower than the combined navies of the rest of the planet. And we have 10 of them. Now, we're in the process of decommissioning all of our carriers to replace them with bigger carriers. <laughs> the Ford class are huge. At current rates of global naval build-out, the rest of the world combined will have approximately the same strength as U.S. Navy in around the year 2265. I'm not worried. Which means that the United States is on the verge of being in a world where we have global reach, but no global interests. And for the roughly four and a half billion people on this planet who are utterly dependent upon global security and global trade for their well-being, for their existence, for their survival, that's quite possibly the worst outcome of all. <coughs> Those of you who have seen this slide don't cheat. The darker the state on this map, the more integrated it is into the international economy, the more dependent it is on exports and imports. Can you guys see the relationship between this and the red-blue split in the United States? Yeah, that's because there isn't one. There is absolutely no connection between how we as a country trade with the world and how we view our own personal politics. None. So we can maintain a globally devastating foreign policy without a ripple of organized resistance here in the United States. Okay, that's number one. Trade's breaking down. U.S. doesn't care. U.S. is, to a certain degree, the cause of the breakdown. Number two is demographics. This is a standard demographic profile, children at the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees, men on one side, women on the other. Simple mortality makes it a pyramid. Now, there's three groups that are relevant. First, you've got your young workers, the people who are just starting out. It's all about the consumption with this group. It's houses, kids, college, cars, pot, spend, 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 spend. But they're new. Their incomes are low. So it's college loans, car loans, mortgages. High growth, this is most of the economic activity in a modern system, but high debt. Your mature workers, kids are moving out, house is getting paid down. Their incomes are high, consumption's low. This is the tax base. These are people trying to save for retirement. This is the investment capital. This is the velocity of money. Then, your retirees. Can't take the volatility, cash and bond, or sorry, uh, stocks and bonds get cashed in and turned into T-bills. Becomes a lot less exciting, and very soon they start drawing from the system in terms of pensions and health care. This is normal. Here's us. Now at the top, you've got your baby boomers. Big group in that capital-rich demographic. They're preparing for retirement. So they are putting all kinds of money away, more than we've ever had. It's made us unprecedentedly capital rich, explosively capital rich, too capital rich. Because all of that money is chasing the same number of opportunities to push down the rate of return on capital. And so they're having to raise their risk profile, their risk tolerance, in order to seek out that mythical 1% of extra return before they retire. And that's pushed them into investments that, in retrospect, probably weren't the best idea. So this is Enron, BRIC, Subprime, and Disco. You know, none of this should have ever happened. Wow. OK, there we go. Now, the Xers, they're the men in the middle. I'm, I'm right here in 1973, smallest birth year in US history. Our problem is one of relative size. Now, there's 75 million retiring boomers, and there's only 11 Xers. Not 11 million, just 11. And we're expected to pay for this retirement group. And we can't vote that away because Xers will not outnumber the boomers until the Xers are in their 70s. <laughs> now, it's good right now. All that extra capital has dropped the cost of borrowing. So for example, I've been able to refinance my house five times in the last six years. My interest rate is 2.04%. It's awesome. It's also temporary. Then you got Generation Y, those narcissistic, Neurotic, omnipresent millennials. <laughs> but thank God they're there. First, all of that consumption, all that craft beer, all those bedazzled flip flops, it adds up. All that consumption's kept us out of recession for the last three years. And you know that they're buying lots because they don't have any socks, so it's going somewhere. <laughs> That's one. Number two, 
In 15 years, when they grow up, define that however you like, <coughs> they'll fill out the tax paying class in a way that Gen X never could. There's a light at the end of the tunnel that's not a train. And third, while the omnipresent millennials are omnipresent here, they aren't anywhere else. If you strip the US out of the developed world data, here's everyone else in 2030. Today, courtesy of the millennials, the United States is the dominant consuming power. And courtesy of the boomers, the United States is the dominant financial power. But by 2030, we're the only consumption power and the only financial power. 2030, that's soon. We are in the great transition. The United States is becoming the only country in the world that can absorb a large <coughs> volume of exports at the same time that politically we are no longer interested in playing that role. And then third is shale. This isn't an energy presentation, so I'm just gonna sum this up in one slide. Exports, or excuse me, uh, exports or production by source is this axis. So here we got OPEC on this side, shale on the far side. Vertical axis is the full cycle break even cost for the production. That's everything from exploration and production on the front end to the midstream transport to taxes on the back end. This is in 2012, and here's where we are now. The break even price for oil in the big four shale fields is now. $37 a barrel. And it's getting better. The technologies that have made this possible, multilateral drilling, micro seismic, water tanks, they're being combined into a new best practices suite that is percolating throughout the industry with increasing speed. And by the time that process is completed, assuming no new technologies, it'll be sometime in 2019, and the break even price will be below $25 a barrel making U.S. shale cost competitive with Saudi Arabia itself. We will add more oil production in the United States this year than the entirety of the OPEC cut. The United States and Canada put together this year will become net oil exporters as a unit, and we can now add output faster, new output faster, at greenfield projects faster than OPEC can bring spare production capacity back online. Any time there is an outage anywhere in the world, shale takes 100% of the cut and adds it to its market share. We're done. Energy independence is now a done thing. North America this year, the United States without Canada by 2020. We're there. So that changes a few things, doesn't it? Now, there's a few things going on in the Trump administration. This is ultimately a Trump talk, so let's uh, introduce you to some of the players. This is Peter Navarro. He's, um, he's kind of a jackass. Uh, he's from UC Davis, which should tell you everything you need to know. <coughs> uh, he uh, has written a series of books about trade. The most famous one is Death by China. You can guess which country is his public enemy number one. Now, Navarro is in charge of the newly founded National Trade Council, which the sole reason to exist is to initiate and fight trade wars. He's Trump's top trade advisor. Yeah, I see that face. That's exactly the right face. Now, Navarro is an academic with absolutely no real, real world experience. Uh, so when uh, reality and his theories tend to clash, he tends to side with his theories. He doesn't see why you know, he should change. It should be reality. So you can imagine how bullheaded this is going to be. And this is the guy who's calling the shots on trade wars. Uh, Lighthizer is even more important. This is Robert Lighthizer. He's the new U.S. trade representative. He is the guy who was responsible for crushing the Japanese economy in the late 1980s on behalf of the Trump, or excuse me, on behalf of the Reagan administration. He forced a series of deals down the Japanese's throat. Uh, he had this lovely negotiating strategy. He'd take off his microphone and uh, disassemble the earpiece while the translation was going on, and then he'd just look up to see if everybody had agreed with what he said. And because he had Reagan's full backing, he got his way. Triggered eight recessions in 25 years, the outcome of what he did. His number one target is China. Then you got the World Trade Organization. This is the institution that adjudicates trade disputes. We wrote the charter. We ratified it in our Senate. This is a Senate treaty. In one of his first policies, the Trump administration issued a trade guidance 
to Congress and to the administration, which in essence says that whenever the WTO makes a ruling that violates US law, US law automatically takes precedence. We've already backed away from the trade order, officially. Now, you may have heard that there's a civil war going on within the administration among the anti-traders and the pro-traders, but you know, that's really not the point. The point is that these two gentlemen are not in the room. This is the Defense Secretary, the National Security Advisor, Mattis and McMaster. Good choices, by the way, in my opinion. Trade in the United States is about security. It's about the alliance. They're not in the room. Conversation's already over. U.S. has already left. It's just a question of how long until the system collapses under its own weight. And at the pace things are going, it's going to be pretty quick. And if that weren't enough, you might have noticed that politics runs a little bit differently in the United States these days. Now, the reason that the Republicans tend to win the really big races is because their coalition is more coherent. It's relatively small. There's five groups that have a series of issues that they care about. You can stack those issues into a platform. You take that platform to the polls, and they don't contradict. So the business community doesn't care what you do with your personal life. They leave that to the evangelicals. The uh, pro-lifers don't want to shut down the Marine Corps. National defense is for the national security guys. They don't fight. They all show up to vote. They tend to win. That's not how it rolls with the Democrats. Black Americans and gay Americans have radically different concepts of what the term civil rights even means. One favors political rights, the other economic rights. Socialists in under 30s, you know, this is the, the Bernie Sanders crowd. I love Senator Sanders. He's just so delightfully out of touch. Oh, <laughs> this warms my heart. <sighs> anyway, uh, <coughs> these guys are always fighting with single mothers, because the single mothers don't see why they should have to pay more taxes to pay for free education for college kids. Uh, unions and greens disagree on every aspect of industrial policy. It's a bigger coalition. It's got more members, but it has more factions, and the factions fight. So unless the Democrats can come up with a charismatic candidate who can paper over, paper over the policy disputes, an appeal and force of personality, the Democrats almost always lose. So Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, they can win. Hillary Clinton, Michael Dukakis don't have a chance. And then in the middle, you've got two groups that tend to be socially conservative, and tend to be economic liber economically liberal, but they're very squishy and hard to nail down. <laughs> now, this is how it has been since roughly 1935. You may have noticed that's not how it rolled this time. So again, let's start with the Republicans. Business community, have you heard of campaign finance reform? The idea that business money is not only not welcome in politics, it's now a criminal offense. This was the first federal election where those rules were fully in play. Business community was excused from the process. So of the 170,000 Republicans who tried to get on the ticket, not one of them was the pro-business candidate for the first time in the history of the party. National security conservatives, solid Republican voting bloc, right? Well, they were until Donald Trump started picking fights with Gold Star families. And they looked to Secretary Clinton as the only member of the Obama team that has any concept of how the world actually worked, the only one who ever went to bat for them. They became swing voters. Evangelicals, another solid right group, right? until we found out that Donald Trump has been in two softcore porn films. <laughs> Google that before you eat, not after. It's revolting. Uh, let's see. The pro-lifers know that three years ago, Donald Trump was not just a registered Democrat, but he had a 35-year political history of being an outspoken advocate of abortion rights. They didn't trust him. They didn't show. It's even worse on the left. Black Americans. They loved Obama. 40-something black dude from South Chicago, what's not to like? They were never going to be excited about a 60-something white chick who had already lived in the White House. I mean, come on, let's be realistic here. They didn't show. Gay Americans got most of what they wanted from the Supreme Court. And then the Orlando massacre happened, confronting them with issues of identity, immigration, 
and security in ways that they had no expertise in processing. They were shell-shocked for this election. Socials in under 30s, the, the feel the burn crowd, right, right, right? Yeah, I love these guys. When finally the Clinton political machine crushed the Sanders campaign and Senator Sanders had no choice but to capitulate and endorse Secretary Clinton, a third of his own audience walked out on him. To the degree that this block voted, they didn't vote for her. The unions, they like Trump on his merits. They like the anti-free trade rhetoric. Hispanics, eight to one against Trump. How do you possibly claw back from that? Come election day, it was only two to one. You see, the pollsters forgot to ask if you were a citizen and could vote. A relevant fact. <laughs> yeah. Hispanic American citizens didn't want the competition from the illegals far more than white Americans. And then Catholics just looked at both sides and wanted to take a shower. Here's where we actually ended up. The two-party system that has run this country since 1935 is broken. Now, this is normal. Every generation or two, the parties reshuffle, the alliances shift, and there's a period of adjustment. Last time, it took 12 years. We had the Great Depression, we had FDR, we had World War II, 12 years. Until then, even if we really believed that our physical and economic security was based on international engagement, even if we could appeal to our better natures, we're incapable of holding the conversation on forming a foreign policy, much less carrying it out. We're going out to lunch. It's going to be a long lunch. So this is what the world looked like to us in 1985. Deep blue. Those are the countries that we were willing to fling nukes to defend. Medium blue, those are the core Bretton Woods allies. Orange, those are the other guys. We don't talk about them. Light blue, field of competition. Everything was in play. Now remove American energy dependence. Change the American definition of security. Turn global demographics inside out so that the United States is the only country with growth potential. And it turns to this. There's just a lot out there that we don't care about anymore. And in a world like this, if you think you need an economic connection to the United States, if you think you need American strategic sponsorship, you have to show up to the White House with a gift. You have to make it worth America's while to put you in the inner circle. Some countries have figured that out. Some, not so much. Three major wars that are coming. First of all, 60% drop post-Cold War in the Russian birth rate. If the Russians are going to use military tactics and attempt to reshape their world, they have to do it right now. By 2022, the Russian military will be less than half the size that it was last year. Here's the Russian problem. The deep red is Russian majority ethnic populations. The light brown isn't like it's unpopulated, it's just not ethnic Russians. This zone is two million square miles of open terrain. From the Russian point of view, where they are right now cannot be defended with the army they have, much less with a smaller one. But if they can forward deploy into these five arcs, 2,000 miles shrinks to about 440 miles. That they can do with a smaller military just have to conquer all of 11 countries, or all are part of 11 different countries. Now that's bad enough if you're Poland or Latvia or Georgia, but for the rest of the world, it's not an academic question because this is the FSU oil export network. That's seven million barrels per day of crude transport capacity. So whether it's the Russians shutting it off so the countries that they're targeting don't have oil, or the countries that they're invading cutting it off, because like why would the Poles sell crude on to Germany when they're being invaded by Russia? I mean, that would be silly. You know, that's going offline. More than enough to cause a global energy-induced depression. That's war one. <laughs> war two, Persian Gulf. <clears throat> now the primary reason that the Persian Gulf has been so calm for the last 40 years, and just marinate in that for a moment, it's Bretton Woods. The US kept a carrier on station in the Gulf at all times. 
The carrier protects the oil flows. The oil flows fuel the alliance. The alliance is, operates by trade. That's how we get our security. But the US now defines its security differently. We've never used the trade. We no longer need the alliance. And now we don't even need the oil. And so we've only had a carrier on station in the Gulf for about 50% of the time for the last two and a half years. It's not the new normal. It's the transition to the new normal of us not having a carrier in the Gulf at all. We already have fewer troops stationed abroad than at any time since 1943, and it's going down, not up. Now, I could tell you about all the reasons why the Iranians and the Saudis, the two countries that are vying for regional supremacy, hate each other. It's ethnic, it's religious, it's political, it's cultural, it's demographic, but that would be really tedious. I'm not going to bore you with that. Just think of it as the fight between the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville, just with more guns. Well, with more guns that people actually use. Uh, down here at the Patterson Tower, you've got <laughs> The Guar Superfield, the world's largest oil producing asset. It is immediately adjacent to the Rastanura loading platform, which is the world's largest loading facility, which is also immediately adjacent to the Abcock oil processing facility, also the largest of its kind. Living on top of the University of Kentucky are two and a half million religious Shia in Sunni Saudi Arabia. Iranian intelligence is working overtime in an attempt to foment revolution there, working from the very accurate assessment that if you destroy the oil income, you destroy Saudi Arabia. Good plan. Not to be outdone, here at Cardinal Stadium, in the province of Khuzestan, you have three million ethnic Arabs living in Persian Iran. Saudi intelligence is attempting to return the favor because living under the University of Louisville is 80% of Iran's oil and natural gas production. That, just, just that, that's 11 million barrels per day of crude. Everybody who's caught in the crossfire, we're now up to 20. I think the Russian war will cause an oil problem. What about this? This is how oil used to be shipped about a year, year and a half ago. Got big flows from the former Soviet Union into Europe and bigger flows from Persian Gulf into Northeast Asia. But you have wars in the Persian Gulf, you have wars involving the Russians, and it turns into this. Oops. Okay, sorry. That's 2015. Former Soviet Union, Southeast Asia. That's where we're going. Europeans reactivate their old imperial networks. They become empires again, because they have to. And there's not enough left for Northeast Asia, which means that the Northeast Asians have their own war. The red bars are net oil imports. The green bars are net oil exports. Notice how conveniently far apart those are. 7,000 miles from Tokyo to Guar. If there's a shortage anywhere in the world, Northeast Asia has to eat the entirety of that shortage because they're the last men in the supply line. Everyone else can take their crude first. There's not enough left, even with a moderate, moderate disruption. So if you are Tokyo or Beijing or Seoul or Taipei, your only choice is to direct your navy to sail to the Persian Gulf, pick sides in a centuries old blood feud, load up the crude yourself, sail it home and hope to God that no one tries to take it from you. Now, if this were anywhere else in the world, I'd be worried. Like, if this was Europe, I'd be really worried. But, you know, this is Northeast Asia, and we all know that the Japanese and the Chinese have a centuries-old history of brotherly love and cooperation, and nothing could possibly go wrong. <laughs> but humor me. As soon as you get shooting, whoops, I'm missing a slide. As soon as you get shooting, you get a series of changes to the international system. You get disruptions to energy shipments, food shipments. This area right here, that's 60% of global supply chain manufacturing steps. Everything we know about the global system falls apart in a matter of weeks. And what do all these problems have in common? The US doesn't care. We're a major food exporter. We're about to be a major energy exporter. We're already a refined product exporter. One of the features of the shale revolution is that natural gas is a waste product, but only here. 
which means that all those petrochemicals that are the basis of a modern industrialized economy, we're now the world's biggest exporter of them all. And manufacturing is already reshoring back to the United States. We're on the verge of a system where inputs and production and consumption don't just need to be physically protected, they have to be co-located. And right now, the only place in the world that that happens is North America. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned earlier, there's some countries that are figuring out what's going on. So let's go through them real quick. Here's China. Now, the Chinese don't have nearly as friendly of a ge geography as we do. Roughly 60% of our territory is highly arable, great land to build on, easy to live in. For the Chinese, it's only about 15% of the total, and they've got a population that's roughly four times ours. Now, up here in northern China, the North China Plain, you basically have a gigantic game of risk. No internal barriers, the river is not navigable, and they spent 3,000 years of genocidal warfare consolidating this into a single political authority. All that, those stories you hear about Chinese empires of ages gone by, they always show you the map at the height of the empire. It is very rare that any of those maps were accurate for more than a couple years at a time. In fact, in some cases, they're only accurate for like six weeks. So these things build up and then collapse, build up and collapse, build up and collapse, and there are huge periods of warlordism and chaos in between. A unified China is not normal. Of the 4,000 years of Chinese history, it's actually only been unified for about 300 years. Two-thirds of that was under Mongol occupation, and the rest is Bretton Woods. Oops. Central China. The Yangtze is the second longest river in the world, and it has the industrial footprint you would expect from that. These are the industrialists, the mercantilists. And then down south, you've got tropics. You've got highlands, sharp featured terrain. Very difficult to project northern power through what is basically a disease belt into the south. So this has always been the last piece that gets consolidated into a greater China. And because they've got the good ports, places like Hong Kong, this is where the foreigners like to play. And the locals like the foreigners because they can't grow enough food to support themselves. So going back 1,200 years, this area has traditionally imported over half their calories. So foreigners bring in their technology, process it with local resources and local infrastructure and local labor to make finished products for export. And in return, these people get to eat. It's a good deal for everybody unless you're up here and you see them as rightly as secessionists. This is why they're hammering down on Hong Kong so hard these days. Now, how do you get all these people to work together? Well, the short answer is you bribe the hell out of them. You provide so many subsidized loans that they, their businesses can employ everyone. Doesn't matter if it's anything even remotely efficient. Give you an idea of how big it is now. You guys remember the Obama stimulus package? $800 billion? 3% of GDP in two years, all the fraud and graft and corruption that went along with that. This is now an Obama stimulus package every 17 days. Now, will you get growth with that? Of course! It's not sustainable, it's not healthy, and as soon as you pull the punch bowl away, the whole thing falls down. It's worse in some places than others. Three types of economic growth. Export-led, that's the blue. That's like Germany. Consumption-led, like here in the United States, that's none of these. Investment-led, that's what China does. The orange, the investment-led growth is greater than all their forms of growth put together. In the red, it's greater than all their forms put together, doubled. Guess where they grow their food? I mean, this is already subprime in every sector of the economy, but the most over-financially leveraged sections are in the interior. So yes, they will have a manufacturing crash, a transport crash, a financial crash when this goes south. They'll also have famine. That's the good news. The bad news is that they're on a high point and this whole thing is kicking into fast forward for them. 25 years after the one child policy, they're running out of 25 year olds. Chinese aren't as good as math as they would have us believe. You guys have all heard about uh, the repeal of the one-child policy. It's now a two-child policy. Well, you know, riddle me this. How long does it take to raise a 25-year-old? Those of you who are parents, don't help. <laughs> Here's Japan. 
Now, Japan is older, not sicker, but older. Now, the Japanese have had 30 years to prepare themselves for this sort of demography. And they've done so by basically eliminating most of their overseas dependency. They're still dependent on energy imports. There's no way around that. But they're no longer dependent on merchandise exports. They solved that problem by taking the entire industrial base that service populations outside of Japan and relocating it next to the places that bought their stuff. You guys know where the largest Toyota facility in the world is? Nicholasville. You know where the second one is? Next door. They're here because that's where the money is. And it gets them on the right side of currency risk, political risk, and President Trump. It's a good strategy. Now, the problem that the Chinese have, of course, is that pending war. But the Japanese have a blue water navy. This is the traditional supply line for tankers going to the Persian Gulf, or from the Persian Gulf. The Japanese have the option of just taking a longer route and being outside range of all of the mainland weapon systems. It's not perfect, but look what the alternative is. Look what it is for China. They're on the wrong side of, a, bleh, the wrong side of an island chain that roughly parallels the coast, and they have to get through the Japanese Navy to load up with crude. It's going to be a short, horrible war. And I'm pretty sure that the Japanese are going to skip away from it at the end. But that'll be the end of the Chinese system. Making matters worse, Abe gets it. When he showed up as the second foreign leader to call on President Trump, he brought $500 billion with him. Good bribe. He promised half a trillion dollars for US infrastructure and manufacturing facilities. That's separate from what corporate Japan is going to do. Now, will it be enough? We'll see. But really, all he needs is the United States to be like, you know, kind of side with Japan. He doesn't even need the United States to fight the war for it. Just needs to make sure that the United States doesn't do anything too crazy when the war is going on. $500 billion, problem, $500 billion will probably do nicely. Give you an idea of just how desperate the Chinese have gotten. This is foreign direct investment between the United States and China. The orange is FDI from here to there. The blue is going the opposite direction, Chinese investment in the United States. Now, for the longest time, it was all American money going to China to build infrastructure and manufacturing plant to participate in supply chains. But in the last few years, it's basically been even as the Chinese seek to acquire technology that they can't make themselves. Watch this. Here's 2016. This is not the Chinese making a bid for control of the United States with some sort of tinfoil hat contraption where they can control our children and make them speak Mandarin. This is Chinese money trying to get the fuck out of Dodge. They know that the end is nigh. And they are trying to preposition their funds in a place where at least they'll get a 0% return. Because it's better than what they get at home. They're terrified. And that's the attitude that President Xi brought to his summit with Trump last week. Back at home, the Chinese are preparing for a complete political lockdown. Democracy doesn't exist over there, but you still have a certain degree of spreading of power. So President Xi has launched what is, in essence, a cult of personality. He's already arrested over 100,000 people on corruption charges. He's already publicly executed on television over 70 top-ranking Communist Party members in an attempt to impress upon the rank-and-file citizenry that he's the man in charge and you should trust him. And come the end of this year, we're supposed to have a leadership transition where Xi announces his successor. He's halfway through his 10-year term. Best guess, he's going to appoint someone who looks a lot like his identical twin. He has already consolidated more power unto his person than any leader in Chinese history with the exception of Mao himself. And this is the year he probably surpasses Mao. They're preparing to wall themselves off from the world, no pun intended. Because if they have to choose between an internationally integrated China that can break apart or a closed poor China that might be able to hold together, there's no choice to make. 
unity is far more important than wealth. Imagine how this conversation went. Drinks are poured. They enjoy a cocktail. Salad plate gets put down. The assistant secretary of defense comes in and puts a menu in front of the president with options for striking Syria. He checks a box. Goes off to carry out his orders. They have their entree, steak and carrots, apparently. And then just before dessert, Trump leans over to she and is like, by the way, I want to make sure you heard this from me, but we just bombed Syria. Let's talk North Korea. <laughs> from what I've been able to discern, Xi put everything on the table. North Korea, energy relations, tech theft, cyber hacking, the energy question, the trade deficit. And within 36 hours of returning to China, he publicly said that the goal was to eliminate the trade deficit and eliminate, eliminate the North Korean nuclear program in its entirety. He is so desperate that he basically went to Mar-a-Lago and rolled over and showed Trump his belly. And Trump was apparently heard something that was enough to make him not go in for the kill right then and there. Will it work? Who knows? Has Trump been had? Who knows? I mean, let's be realistic here. The guy might, change, the guy might not even remember the conversation at this point. <laughs> but there's been a one hell of a public inflection point in the relationship, with now the rhetoric starting to match the reality that's been behind the curtain the whole time. Closed China, desperately trying to make sure that the United States doesn't kick over the table before the Chinese have any chance of surviving it. <laughs> On another depressing topic. <laughs> Northern European Plain, big chunk of long, flat, open ter territory crisscrossed by 11 north-south flowing rivers. They're not integrated, so you get different cultures on all these rivers. Now, but this section is very easy to develop. It's flat, it has winter insect kills, easy transport. That's the Europe that matters. This is the Europe with money, but that's not all of Europe. You go into southern Europe and you get red, that's the highlands. You get arid zones, you get peninsulas, you get islands, areas that are much more difficult to develop. So as easy it is to get rich here, it's hard to do so in Spain or southern Italy or Greece or Turkey. But then you have exceptions to the exceptions. Places that are in these weird geographies that happen to be flat and well watered. Places like northern Italy or England or Sweden. Places where you have political independence from northern Europe, but still wealth. And they thought it would be a great idea to put this all into the same trade zone. This is what happens. You put this all in the same trade zone, especially in the same currency zone, and whatever advantages these weaker states had, they now can't compete with this. All the euro has done is it picked up 50 years of economic development and job development, industrial development in the periphery, and relocated it to more efficient economies. By its very definition, a common currency, it gives better advantages to the place with a naturally superior geography. And so with every day the Eurozone continues to exist, the periphery falls further behind. The country that matters the most is, of course, Germany. The German geography is old. It's aging rapidly. And have you guys heard of what's going on with Deutsche Bank these days? Nobody? Okay. Deutsche Bank, largest financial institution in Europe, and traditionally the most stable. But think about how banks make their money. It's about the spread between the cost of the funds and the cost of the loans. So you want more loans with a bigger spread. That's how banks make money. Well, no 20-somethings. There are no loans. Interest rates in the Eurozone are negative. There's no spread. Fewer loans, less spread, banks go belly up. It's not that I think Deutsche Bank is the face of the future. I think Deutsche Bank is the best case example, or best case scenario. Because for those of you who have actually met Germans, you know, they're kind of sticklers for details and accounting and transparency, you know, crazy things like that. What about these guys, Italy? <laughs> like, hello. No, this, by the way, is in one quick graphic, why the European financial crisis must end in tears. Consumption-led growth is now impossible. 
The banking question is the question for Europe. Blue is the percentage of total credit in the private sector that comes from banks. In the United States, it's only 30%. We prefer the faceless stock market. In Europe, it's 70 to 80%. So if the banks crash, that means no positive economic growth ever again. Because you can't have credit lubricating anything and there's no other method. Even worse, it's probably imminent. Now, a non-performing loan is a loan that is no longer being paid, so the bank ultimately has to write it off and take the loss. Now, here in the United States, we're right here, non-performing loans are just under 2% of the total. If you are 31 days late on your loan payment, you are considered impaired. If you are 91 days late, you are considered foreclosable. That's an NPL for us, 91 days late. That's our definition. The European definition of an NPL, <laughs> you're gonna love this. If you're 271 days late, but you've made a partial payment during that period, you're in good standing. That's these numbers. Italy, by its own definition, already has a 1.5 trillion euro NPL stack. Their economy is one-fifth the size of ours. At the height of subprime, when mortgages were snapping like chopsticks, we had 150 billion US of loans go bad. In absolute terms, this is 20 times our problem. In relative terms, it's 100 times our problem. And that's using their data. Use any real data, and you have entire countries in Europe that should be foreclosed upon. You hit 5% in the United States, the FDIC closes your bank down. Most country, important country in Europe is right in the middle, Germany. Here's the German zone. Four major rivers, but they don't connect, unlike the greater Midwest system. So political unity doesn't come naturally to Germany. In order to make it work, you've got to find some way to mobilize everything. Because as big as Germany is, everybody else put together is bigger. So you have to invest in efficiency, a better labor force, better infrastructure, better industrial plant. This is why the Germans are so good at everything. They see themselves as always being outnumbered. They are always outnumbered. But if you take German efficiency and marry it to Germany's size, you get a regional superpower that is irresistible. And everybody doesn't necessarily want to buddy up with the Germans. Because if you do, you're going to be subsumed. And so you've got eight other major powers in Europe that are right on Germany's doorstep. And whenever Germany is united and starts to get wealthy and starts to get big, everybody else gangs up on it and tears it down. And then they have to deal with German weakness. And this is European history, going back to the Roman Empire, strength and weakness of the center. And how do you deal with each extreme? Bretton Woods did away with this. Just like Bretton Woods made China functional by removing the Japanese from the field and allowing the Chinese to export their way to wealth, Bretton Woods changed the map of Europe by putting everyone on the same side, allowing the Germans to import raw materials from the wider world instead of having to conquer France to get them. So you can imagine how the German meeting went. <laughs> Merkel didn't get it. She was the third person to visit. She came and she basically told Trump that, do you realize that if you withdraw from the global trade order, that that's the end of Europe, that that's the end of Germany? And apparently his response was something along the lines of, uh-huh. She didn't bring anything. She just asked for stuff. And so on her way out the door, Trump gave her a goodbye present, a bill for services rendered for defending Germany for the last 25 years. The German-American relationship is already over, which means that the German-NATO relationship is already over. She gets it. British Prime Minister Theresa May, first person in the door. The ink was not even dry on the stationery when she made her trip. Second week on the job, she walked in the door. They held hands. It was kind of creepy. <laughs> Guided tour. 
Now, Theresa May is currently going through the Brexit negotiations, and she knows that Britain ultimately needs to find a new way to operate. And the fact that Brexit is happening at the same time that the US is backing away is just coincidental. So she's probably very smart in getting out ahead of this as quickly as possible. <coughs> she basically said, OK, we've got the special relationship. Not only A, do I want to continue that, B, is there anything else we can help you with? We've got two supercarriers coming online. They're going to be the only other supercarriers in the world. How can we integrate them with your Navy better? Good start. We're part of the Five Eyes of Intelligence Sharing. We're going to double our intelligence budget because of Brexit. We want to share all of that with you, too. Great second. And the list just went on and on and on and on and on. She gets it. So. As a going away present, they agreed to launch free trade talks. And this isn't the only place that Theresa May has done that. She's done it in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, India, and Turkey as well. Now, technically, this is illegal under EU law. The EU Commission, which is their executive, has full authority to negotiate all trade deals on behalf of all members. And Britain is still a member. So the debate in Europe is how do we punish Britain, not just for leaving, but for having the gall to prepare for what happens the next day. Really? I mean, let's review here, Europe. You have a NATO crisis, a demographic crisis, a consumption crisis, an export crisis, a financial crisis, a debt crisis, a Russian crisis, a Turkish crisis, and you're drowning in amber waves of refugees. And you want to bitch about Britain? You know, this is an institution that is incapable of adjusting course, that can't even fathom a world in which they don't have American security overwatch and global market access. It's just a question of how soon it's going to implode. And if what's going on with Deutsche Bank and the Italian banking structure starts to snap this year, it is going to be very fast. Because if you look at the debt stack, the sovereign debt stack of Greece, and compare that to just, just the Italian banking sector, it's 15 times as bad. It is fundamentally, technically impossible for the Europeans to build a fence around that. They can't bail out something of that scale. And because of cross-collateralization, it digs into the heart of the German and the French system immediately. They're a dead man walking. OK. so. Well, that was fun. Uh, if you're looking for a, you know, a, a doorstop or a coaster, a couple second suggestions. Uh, first, you've got The Accidental Superpower. That's the first book. That's about how we got to where we are, how it's all coming crashing down, where it will take us, and the five major international crises that Americans are going to care about the most. The Absent Superpower, that's the new one. That's about the shale revolution, how it's evolved, what that means for American industry and the American economy where that's taking us, the major wars that were a result as a, as a consequence of it, and how Americans are going to carry out their foreign policy in the future. Please review me on Amazon. That would be awesome. <laughs> I'm going to put this up here, and uh, we can go wherever you guys want with Q&A with, with the time we've got left. This is how I see American foreign policy kind of sketching out in the future. The two zones that are surrounded by the hashes, those are areas where I expect American corporate power and American government power to kind of fuse together, like we did back in 1898 to 1920. It's a very effective combo, <laughs> one-two punch, if you will. It's not necessarily what we would consider ethical. But if we're talking about the breakdown of the global order, it's probably as good as it's going to get. As for the colors, the blue countries are countries with good demography, good local energy access, and no meaningful security threats. The greens have the energy and the demography, but they've got some security problems to worry about. So those are places that I expect to be stable enough for American business to be interested. Whew, I can barely stand. OK, questions? Yes? Oh, oh, second. oh. I've got to bring the microphone. Uh, thank you again. No problem. If I can grab Jake and Evan, we'll be passing the microphone around. Make sure to use it so we can hear you and we can get it on tape. Um, and as always, this is our warning that these are for questions and not small speeches. So Evan, I'll hand this to you. All right. <clears throat> Sir. Okay. <laughs> so how do you think the U.S. financial markets are going to react to all this? 
Well, as we've seen in the last six months, the U.S. dollar is on a bit of a tear. I mean, we're kind of taking a breather right now. But keep in mind that you've got conservatively 30 trillion euro of portable assets in the European Union. All of that will need to be converted to something else. So even if we do everything wrong, there's only one hard currency left in the world. So I expect that right now we are at multi-decade lows for the U.S. dollar. So that's the currency. The stock market question, dear God, uh, it's going to be a roller coaster, but it's probably going to be a roller coaster that's broadly going up. Because as you have more and more capital flight, and based on how you do the math, we've had somewhere between two and a half trillion and five and a half trillion dollars of capital flight in the last 24 months. It's got to be broadly positive. Now, most of that money is going into T-bills, residential real estate, particularly in the gateway cities, and shale bonds but it's trying to find additional outlets. Stock market is one possibility. Infrastructure bonds is another possibility because what, what this foreign money wants is something with a government guarantee, preferably a hard asset and preferably with a dividend stream. And the stock market gives you two of those three. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. And remember, to be perfectly blunt, this is scared dumb money. If it gets 50 cents on the dollar back after 10 years, that's great because it's better than zero. Just to follow up, uh, I just spent seven weeks in Australia and New Zealand. Me too. And <clears throat> great, great experience. I thought I recommend Great experience. <laughs> but in any event, obviously, you've got a lot of capital coming out of China going mm -hmm. into those countries. Yep. And the commercial real estate markets and the residential real estate markets in particular mm -hmm. are off the charts. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're exceeding what we saw here back in the yeah. early What the 2000s. foreign money, in particular the Chinese money want, they want real estate. Of course, they want real estate with no number fours in it, but that's another topic. But if you're going into Australia and New Zealand or the United Kingdom, there are very limited, limited options. I mean, they know London, they know Auckland, they know Sydney. And you get huge price inflation in those three places, making it almost impossible for the locals to afford. But not a lot in the secondary cities. Now, in Canada, you have a little bit more. You've got Vancouver, Quebec, and Toronto. But even in Toronto, it's gotten so bad that downtown Toronto now only has a 20% occupancy rate because it's 70% owned by foreigners who have no intention of ever living there. So you can't afford to live in Toronto anymore. Now in the US, we've got more gateway cities. We've got San Francisco, Seattle, Santa Monica, New York City, Miami. And we have a number of secondary cities off the coasts that foreigners are aware of. So we're seeing a secondary flow of capital coming out of those gateway cities and into Houston and Austin and Denver and Salt Lake City and Richmond and Minneapolis and Chicago. It takes some of the steam out of it. Uh, but in absolute terms, we're getting 70% of the global total. But do you see a major distortion in valuations occurring? I think we've already had it, and yes, there's going to be more. But here, it won't be as extreme as in the other Anglo states because there's just a bigger pool here to go to. Don't be shy. There we go. What do you think would maybe draw us back out of our shell and back into the world again after this occurs? Well, there's the good answer, and then there's the more realistic answer. The good answer. As we figure out what it means to be a Democrat and what it means to be a Republican, because we don't know what that's going to settle on, hopefully it will fall in a way where one party or the other is interested in foreign affairs and doing something more than a knee-jerk kind of reaction, which would be something that we really haven't had since 1885. That'd be nice. I don't, can't say it's going to be constructive, but you know, if it was based on something other than ignorance, that'd be great. I'm not very hopeful, more likely. World breaks down. We get these three major wars, which leads to a global energy cataclysm, which results in civilizational breakdown for at least one quarter of the planet, maybe a third. The uh, reintroduction of the British, Japanese, French empires. Hopefully they get along. Uh, you've got the disintegration of the Russian state along with all of those several thousand nuclear warheads, civil war in a country like that. China falls apart. They've got 100 warheads too. I mean, the Israelis are fine. They'll just pop some corn and watch the whole world burn around them. They're okay. They won all their wars. They've got their wells built. It's very World War Z. 
Um, but sooner or later, someone will emerge from the chaos. And that someone will try to impose some sort of order on their near abroad, and then the step beyond. And at that point, the United States is likely to look over and think, hey, we don't remember giving you permission to be a major power. And we start it all up again. Now, that probably will take 30 years. Now, had this happened before World War II, that correction cycle is only a decade, maybe two. But everyone has had 70 years to be used to the United States providing security and wealth for everybody. And it will take at least 30 years for everybody to kind of get their feet back under them and re-expand. The question is, how does the United States treat those 30 years? The last three times this happened, we disarmed. I don't think that's likely this time around. And even if we disarmed three quarters of our military, that still makes us the biggest, baddest player on the block. We have time for one more question. Uh, this is kind of a minor question, but the blue blob there, Europe, I know that's Europe, is that just France and Switzerland? Or is uh, there France, anything? France, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. Oh, okay, that's all I wanted to know. Okay. You know, if there anybody else was in there. No, those are countries that I think are going to do pretty well. None of them are involved in the Russia war. What's the, okay. what's the volume of shale inventory in North America? Uh, on the natural gas side, we know there's, there's at least 150 years at current production volumes, probably at current prices. So plenty there. On oil, it's hard to tell. Uh, the SEC has a rule where you have to report your economically recoverable reserves for stock purposes. The problem is, is if you tell the world that you have more than 30 years of oil reserves at your current production level, you have identified yourself as a takeover target. So magically, every shale firm in the United States has 30 years of reserves on the book. They undoubtedly all have more, but what the number is, they will not tell me. Best guess, double that. And remember, that's with today's technology. The technology keeps getting better. So shale is not forever, but it's certainly for the rest of our lives. All right, yeah, one more time, let's give Mr. Zion a round of applause for that great, great lecture.